Should more children be back at school? Email any questions at bbc.co.uk to ask the head teacher and winner of the contrarian prize, Catherine Burbel Singh, the former education secretary, Labour's Lord Blunkett, and as Northern Ireland says pupils will only need to be one metre as opposed to two metres apart at school, the health minister at Stormont, Robin Swan. Plus, as football returns but theatres remain closed, we have the culture secretary, Oliver Dowden, who's also responsible for media. What should be the role and responsibilities of social media firms like Facebook or Twitter in our politics. Send me your questions and your phone number. Any questions at bbc.co.uk. We're on at 8 o'clock tonight, 10 past 1 tomorrow lunchtime. Chris Mason there and in the next hour of the programme we'll be speaking to the Education Minister Nick Gibb and hearing from Andrew Lloyd Webber on his plans to get theatres up and running again. And is it time for English rugby to get a new anthem? You're listening to Today on Radio 4 with Michelle Hussain and Justin Webb. It's 8 o'clock on Friday the 19th of June. The headlines this morning, £1 billion will be earmarked for helping England's children catch up on lost learning, with tutors coaching some pupils worst hit by the school closures. Government borrowing for May stood at an estimated £55 billion, a record high for any month. And Australia's Prime Minister has accused hackers backed by another state of trying to target many of his country's businesses and institutions. The BBC News is read this morning by Jane Steele. A billion pounds of funding is being made available to primary and secondary schools in England to help children who've fallen behind because of the coronavirus crisis. By September, many pupils will have been out of class for nearly six months, and the government wants some of the money to be used for subsidised tutoring. Head teachers welcomed the funds as a significant investment, but said more details were needed. Labour said ministers should convene a task force involving trade unions and scientific and health experts to help all pupils return to school safely as soon as possible. Here's our education editor, Branwyn Jeffries. In the next academic year, schools in England will be given an extra £650 million. Head teachers can decide how it's spent, but the government is making it very clear that small group tuition is the preferred option. The Institute for Fiscal Studies said this money represented around £80 a year extra per child, or a 1% increase, to deal with the biggest educational challenge in generations. A further £350 million will create a national tutoring programme aimed at disadvantaged children, an approach for which there is good evidence. For schools to draw on this programme, they will have to meet around a quarter of the cost themselves. The two main head teachers unions said the extra money was welcome, but the Association of School and College Leaders added it was disappointing there was no money for either 16 to 18 year olds or early years provision. A major analysis shows that people of South Asian origin are the most likely to die from coronavirus after being admitted to hospital in England, Wales and Scotland. The study, which is expected to be published in the Lancet Medical Journal, looked at data on 4 in 10 of all patients treated for the disease across 260 hospitals. Here's our health and science correspondent, James Gallagher. This is a huge and influential study. It shows people from South Asian backgrounds were 20% more likely to die after being admitted than white people. Other minority ethnic groups did not have a higher death rate. The study also reveals profound differences in who needs hospital care based on ethnicity. South Asian patients were, on average, a massive 12 years younger than white patients. They also had significantly higher levels of diabetes, which the researchers say explains some of the increased risk. Government borrowing has risen to a record high because of the lockdown. In May, it stood at an estimated £55 billion, pounds, nine times more than the same month last year. Net debt is now larger than the size of the economy for the first time since 1963. The Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, said the coronavirus was having a severe impact on the public finances and the best way to restore them was to safely reopen the economy. Here's our economics correspondent, Andy Verity. In May, the economic shutdown meant the tax man collected 31% less in tax than he did last year, with VAT, for example, down by 46%. At the same time, central government spending jumped by 50%, for example, on the job retention scheme and the self-employed income support scheme. 
That forced the government to borrow £55 billion in May alone to cover the gap between its income and its spending, nine times what it borrowed in the same month last year. In the two full months since lockdown began, the Chancellor borrowed £103.7 billion, 87 billion more than the same period last year, and the highest borrowing over two months on record. Add that to the debt already accumulated, and the UK's public sector debt jumped by more than 20 percentage points to reach nearly £2 trillion, or 1,950 billion to be precise. That's a little more than the size of the entire economy, the first time it's been that high in 57 years. However, because interest rates are so low and financial institutions are hungry for safe investments, such as lending to governments, there's little risk that the government will struggle to borrow further record sums. The Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison has said his country's government and institutions are being targeted in a cyber hack by what he called a sophisticated state-based actor. He urged all organisations to improve their cyber defences but stressed there had been no large-scale breaches of personal or official data so far. Our Sydney correspondent Shaima Khalil reports. Scott Morrison said the attacks involved all levels of government as well as essential service providers and businesses. He added that experts had identified it as a state hack because of the scale, the nature of the targeting and the trade crafts used, and that not many countries were capable of such operations. When asked whether China was behind the attacks, Mr. Morrison declined to comment. But Australia's intelligence officials have repeatedly warned of efforts by Beijing to meddle in the country's affairs. Relations between the key trading partners worsened after Australia called for an independent inquiry into the origins of the coronavirus, first detected in China late last year. Beijing has since imposed tariffs on Australian barley, stopped beef imports and recently warned Chinese citizens about the risks of travelling to Australia because of racist incidents. A review of Labour's heavy defeat in last December's general election has warned that a new leader in Sir Keir Starmer will not be enough for the party to win back power. The report, commissioned by the Labour Together Group, which seeks to unite different wings of the party, found that internal arguments and poor organisation were key factors in the result. The shadow business minister, Lucy Powell, was part of the review team. She told this programme there were also many other lessons to learn. Not only was this and historic defeat for us culminating from Brexit leadership and a manifesto that wasn't seen as credible but it was a long time coming the so-called red wall has been crumbling for 20 years and the disconnect between Labour and its traditional working class voters have trends that go far back the Bank of England has become the latest organisation to apologise for past links to slavery. The move comes in the wake of the recent Black Lives Matter protests. Our business correspondent Rob Young reports. The Bank of England says it was never directly involved in the slave trade, but it has acknowledged that former governors and directors of the bank had what it calls inexcusable connections. When slavery was abolished in 1833, the government paid compensation to slave owners for their loss of what was termed at the time human property. A database compiled by University College London suggests 11 former bank governors and 16 former directors either benefited from those payments or had links to the slave trade. The bank says it has started a thorough review of its collection of images of former officials to make sure that none with any involvement in slavery are displayed anywhere in the bank. The government's spending watchdog says the removal of dangerous cladding from high-rise buildings in England in the wake of the Grenfell Tower fire won't be completed for another two years. A report by the National Audit Office says the programme should already have been finished, but there's still a long way to go. Here's our Home Affairs correspondent, Tom Simons. Work has not yet begun to remove the most dangerous type of cladding from more than a third of tall buildings in England. As a result, thousands of people are living in developments which need a waking watch to raise the alarm in a fire. The entire programme was supposed to have been completed this month. The government made the money available to speed things up, a total of £600 million. But there have been problems identifying who owns some blocks. 
issues with building contractors and a shortage of skilled staff, particularly fire engineers. The chair of the Public Accounts Committee, Meg Hillier, said building owners and developers should be footing the bill, not taxpayers. She's also warning that deadlines for making safe hundreds more blocks with other types of dangerous materials are unrealistic. The government said progress had been made, but there was still much more to do. A police officer has been shot dead in New Zealand and another has been seriously injured during a routine traffic stop in Auckland. It's the first time in 11 years that an officer has been killed in the line of duty in the country. A Dutch art detective known as the Indiana Jones of the art world says he's received two photos that prove a stolen Van Gogh oil painting has not been destroyed. The 1884 work, entitled Spring Garden, disappeared after a break-in at a museum near Amsterdam in March. Anna Holligan reports from The Hague. The first photo shows the missing masterpiece lying on a black plastic sheet next to a copy of the New York Times newspaper dated the 30th of May 2020 and a book about a 2002 robbery which supports the theory that the Spring Garden was seized in a copycat heist. The second features a distinctive plaque on the back of the painting which suggests it's authentic. Arthur Brand, who's a specialist in recovering lost and stolen art, said the pictures had been circulating in mafia circles. Thieves often end up destroying valuable paintings because of the hassle involved in reselling them. These photos appear to represent the first proof that the missing Van Gogh painting still exists. Anna Holligan reporting the time is 10 past 8. We'll be doing a huge amount of catch-up for pupils over the summer months, the Prime Minister said last week. And today that programme for England will be announced by the Education Secretary, Gavin Williamson. It is now described as a programme to be delivered throughout the next academic year. £650 million for schools and another £350 million for tutoring for the most disadvantaged pupils. Well, Nick Gibb, the Education Minister, is on the line. Good morning. Good morning. What happened to the huge amount of catch-up over the summer months that the Prime Minister spoke of? Well, of course, we have the, um, uh, the uh, holiday and action uh, activities food programme over the summer, but this money can be used uh, by schools if they wish to have summer programmes. Um, but, but if you want children to catch up, it, it can't just be done over the month of August. It has to be a long, longer term over the academic year and what this £650 million does is enable schools to use their discretion uh, with advice from the Education Endowment Foundation how best to ensure that every child is able to catch up on the education that they may have lost while they've been at home. Of course, schools have been doing a great job in, in providing work and support and lessons for children while they are at home, but there's nothing better, of course, than school, children being at school and this catch-up money is to make sure that every child is able to catch up. And then on top of this, there's a £350 million for one-to-one -one tuition for uh, children from disadvantaged backgrounds. Indeed, but when, the, when, when most people, when they understand catch-up, it's going to be educational catch-up that they're going to assume the Prime Minister was talking about that day. And it's, it's all very well for you to speak of holiday activities, but a lot of that is literally holiday activity. It's not educational work, is it? Well, Teach First is also uh, launching its uh, summer school uh, toolkit. This is advice for uh, schools about how if they want to run summer camps, they can do so with, a, with help from Teach First. But the key thing is that you can't just re recover lost education in one month. You need a longer term approach over the academic year. And that's why this is such a significant sum of money, a billion pounds in total. Uh, 650 million straight to schools so they can provide that educational catch-up for young people and if schools want to run uh, summer camps uh, they can do so or summer catch-up uh, time for children they can do so and they can knowing this money is coming uh, they'll be able to to fund such programs with advice from Teach First with advice from the Education Endowment Foundation. The Institute for Fiscal Studies has worked out that this sum of money is equivalent to 80 pounds per pupil is that sufficient in your view to make up for this huge educational challenge represented by the loss of schooling for so many? Well, on top of this, there's a £350 million pounds that, that is going to be used for one-to-one -one tuition. We're working with, again, with the Education Endowment Foundation, who will be using uh, evaluated tutorial companies, tutor companies, to provide that online one-to-one -one tuition to young people who have lost out, those children from disadvantaged uh, 
backgrounds. Again, at the discretion of the of the head teacher. Yeah, but again, um, that's probably going to be about a million children, isn't it? If if you take the numbers on free school meals in in England, which is 1.3 million as the most obvious indicator of disadvantage, that is not all children who have been adversely affected by this loss of schooling. No, that's why the 650 million, that is for all children. Um, and it is a very significant uh, sum of money. It's a whole raft of advice provided by the EF of the kind of things that schools can do, uh, evidence-based approaches to ensure that we can help children to catch up. But the people that know their children best are the head teachers and teachers of the schools. And that's why we have allocated the money direct to the schools so that they can then decide how to deploy uh, with extra resources so to help those So can they children. decide exactly how they spend it? Because there's a big emphasis on small group tuition, but if a head teacher feels that they want to spend it on another form of teaching or, or on something else entirely, can they do that? Yes, they can. Uh, we, we, absolutely. We want to give schools the discretion to use this money in the way they see fit. But we're also providing advice via the Education Endowment Foundation that has a menu of different things that they might want to consider, which are based on evidence of how effective those approaches are uh, in terms of helping children to catch up on their lost education. Now, this government you know, is absolutely determined uh, that, A, we will not let any child's education be badly affected by the coronavirus crisis, but also the work we've been doing since 2010 to close that attainment gap between children from disadvantaged backgrounds and the rest. We don't want to see all that work undone by this, by this crisis. We want to make sure all children... Yeah, you, you, you say yeah. that this government is determined not to leave any child behind and you have been a very long serving minister with this particular portfolio on education. So you've seen a lot of a, a, a lot in your time. Would you accept that this has been one of the big missing links in the government's response to the pandemic? You you had this original plan to get children back into school in England in June. That didn't happen. Even now, can you say when all children in England will be back in school? Well, we, we are, our clear intention is that all children will be back in school in September. We've, we've been planning, uh, officials have been working uh, for, for a long time on this uh, package. We knew when we closed schools that there would be uh, a need for a catch-up program. We've had a very careful plan about the opening of schools. Don't forget, all, 90% of schools have been open this whole period for children of critical workers and vulnerable children. But we've had a very careful phased approach to children returning to school on the you, June you the 1st, to, it was well, reception you, you, had to do a big, you had to do a big U-turn, didn't you? And Gavin Williamson had to do that when it became obvious that, in his words, you were not able to welcome children back. And, and even now, it is only an intention to get children in England back in school in September, when every other part of the UK has a plan for how it's going to do that. In, indeed, in Northern Ireland, they've decided a one-metre distance is sufficient in school, and they can guarantee that children will be back in September. Why can't we do the same in England? Well, our clear intention is children will come back in September. Of course, we always led by the advice of the, of the scientists, the sage advice. Um, but we, are, we have over a million children now back in our school system. Uh, we're doing so in a phased, careful approach because safety of the teachers and the pupils lies at the heart of all our decision making. And that's why it is a cautious approach to returning students. We've got from June the 15th, now we have year 10 and year 12 coming back, those who are doing the A-levels and GCSEs. Uh, next year, they're coming back part-time. Every step is phased, it's planned. We give schools a lot of notice. We talk to schools, we talk to the unions uh, about these plans and about the approach. But we are clear intention now is that we'll have all children back uh, in September because we, the best place for children uh, is in school with their teacher, with their friends. There is something striking missing in, in what you've announced today, apart from the, the lack of a guaranteed plan to get to get uh, children in England back into school. But the, the other striking thing that's missing is that early years and 16 to 18 year olds have not been part of this, uh, of, of the catch up program. And uh, have a listen to this, because this is the reaction that we had um, from Neil Leach, who's the chief executive of the Early Years Alliance can't understand the logics of that. Everybody understands, everybody recognises that education doesn't just start at the school gate. Once again, early years is marginalised. Can you explain to him the logic of that, of leaving not only the early years but 16 to 18 year olds out? Well, early years is absolutely key. We absolutely agree with that. We are working uh, with early years experts and the Education Endowment Foundation and developing the best way to support those children is as well. Is there going to be a catch-up programme and money well, we'll, we'll, for that? Well, we'll, 
Well, we're working with those experts, and we'll have more to say on that uh, soon. In terms of 16 to 19, again, we're working with, uh, uh, with experts on this issue. The focus has been on schools. That's the purpose of today's package. Actually, the 16 to 19-year-olds have fared better uh, with remote education than other age groups. They're older, they're more mature, they're more self-motivated. So there has been more effective. So that's why our focus at the moment is on schools. They might um, not have access to technology, might they, all of those pupils? And I, I don't think, unless you can update us on the figures, that, that the full number of laptops that were promised on April the 19th have yet been distributed? Uh, a huge amount number of computers have been distributed. 100,000 have been distributed to local authorities and they are distributing those to schools. There's a promise a of 200,000, wasn't there, in April? Yes, we're we're only halfway there. And there's more, there's more on their way. This is a massive operation. We have uh, managed to get built 200,000 laptops and uh, tablets in the global marketplace when there's huge demand for these items. They have been successfully uh, delivered on time and they're now going to, they're now with the local authorities who are now distributing those uh, items to uh, the children that uh, absolutely need them. I mean, as, as, as many people look at the government's overall uh, response, you, the, the, the picture on schools is, is part of what has been seen repeatedly in terms of the government making a promise that it wasn't able to fulfil on time. And we see that uh, on, on the return to schools and then we see that also in what has just happened on the coronavirus tracing app where the, where the NHS has had to, had to abandon its own app and go for the Apple Google model instead. Is it part of a pattern? No, you, 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 you pick on the things that go wrong and, and fail to tell your listeners of things that are actually going on. You know, we've had, uh, we, within weeks of um, the schools closing, we had materials for parents and schools to use at home. We have initiated this uh, massive £100 million purchase of computers for those children that don't have access to the computer. Which, is not, which has not been fulfilled. Yes, well, it is being fulfilled on time. These are getting to children. Uh, we've got the Oak National Academy that was set up within two weeks by 40 teachers providing 180 very high quality video lessons every week. There's a huge amount uh, going on to support children at home. And now we have this phased approach uh, two schools uh, op uh, welcoming back more children reception year one year six there are a million more than a million children in schools as we speak this is a fast moving very challenging set of circumstances that the government is facing all governments around the world are facing but we are delivering we are doing the things that we need to do obviously there there, there are some things we can always do better but we, this is a government that's working tirelessly to make sure that children's education while we're doing this crisis, continues as best we can. We want to get children now back into our schools. We have a clear intention of getting all children back into school by September. We're announcing today this £1 billion package for catch-up uh, that we've been working on for weeks to make sure that children don't lose out to their education. So, you know, it'd be nice to occasionally to focus on things that we are doing and are doing well to make sure that uh, every child is protected. And there's a huge amount going on to make sure that the most vulnerable families in our society are protected while we're undergoing this crisis, because we've always been aware that it's the most uh, disadvantaged families that will uh, suffer most from this crisis, and we're trying to do everything we can to help those particular families and to help those particular children of those families catch up on their lost education. That's what this one-to-one -one online uh, tuition is all about that we've announced today. Finally, Mr. Gibb, your view on, the, on, on taking the knee as an anti-racism gesture, would you do it? In the right circumstances, yes, of course. But my focus, the focus of the government, the work I do, is about making sure we address the injustices that are the subject of these campaigns. And it's wonderful we have a, a, a country that, where you can protest, you can make your views clear that we are a tolerant and open society that's been built on uh, over the centuries on, on waves of immigration from around the world. And that's why our culture uh, in this country is so vibrant and, uh, and, uh, and welcoming. Um, but uh, we, are, we are working on making sure that uh, children from all backgrounds, all ethnicities, have the best education possible to make sure that the schools serving different communities are the best that they can be, and that's why our school improvement has been so successful. Uh, black uh, children are doing better than ever in our schools. Uh, there are more uh, young uh, people from 
black communities going to our universities. It's risen from, I think, 44% to something like 59% going to our universities. So this is absolutely key part of our education agenda and it's also part of the government's agenda. Nick Gibb, Education Minister, thank you. 23 minutes past eight is the time. We can go back to the theatre, can and should, in part because the arts are part of civilization, but also, uh, of course, in London, they're a big part of the economy. And the person telling us it is possible, the cue is in what you have just heard, is Andrew Lloyd Webber, and is using as his example the extraordinary fact that Phantom has carried on, is the only large-scale English language performance going on anywhere. That is what we think, at any rate. Not in London, but in South Korea. And Lord, Lloyd Webber is on the line. Morning to you. Good morning. Tell us how you've managed to make it work in South Korea. Well, uh, it's really the local producers um, who, who've done the extraordinary work there. And I should make it clear that it did close, you know, the onset of the virus, um, but it reopened again. Mm. And then it actually closed once more because they had a, a, a case backstage and then it reopened in, and it's now been uh, opened now for about two and a half months. Um, but the key thing that they have is incredibly good hygiene in every single possible way, um, both backstage for the cast and the crew and the orchestra, um, but also for people in the front of the house. And, and the, the whole point is to try and make people feel as safe and secure as they possibly can. Uh, and for example, they have thermal imaging cameras at the stage door and as you come into the theatre that can absolutely identify if anybody has a temperature extremely quickly. And these are the things I think the airlines are, are also d d developing. They've got, um, and we've ordered for uh, my little test, we've ordered all of that. We've uh, ordered um, hygienic door handles, the self-cleaning handles, I think they're called silver ion hygienic door can <laughs> candle covers. Uh, for somebody who's not technical like me, I just have to believe that. Um, but apparently these are completely effective against pathogens like cor coronavirus, you know, for at least, um, for, for a long period of time. Uh, everybody going into the theatre is fogged uh, with the antiviral chemical which has a 30-day life span and the theatre itself is fogged as, as everything is backstage right. after every performance. Um, but no social distancing? No social distancing because it's impossible in the yeah. theatre. Okay, so tell us about your experiment because you want to do it here, don't you? Where and when? Well, what I hope to do uh, is to be able to demonstrate to the government what has happened in Korea at the London Palladium, hopefully in the first week of July. We're, we're just waiting. We've just had the final bits of equipment delivered into England. They're just clearing customs at the moment. We hope to have them in the theatres next Monday. Then we're going to do a whole series of tests there to see whether or not it's, it's going to work. The reason we've chosen the London Palladium is, is it's a very big theatre. It's just under 2,300 seats. And it's the biggest theatre we have, and therefore, in one sense, the most problematic. So we want to be able to demonstrate there that this this can work. I mean, all we can do is to try and be positive. I really, really believe that we in theatre must be positive and use everything that we can to demonstrate that we can open. If we, if having done that, we failed, at least we tried. Uh, that's my point. And is the government uh, cooperating? Interested? I've had a couple of uh, phone calls with Oliver Dowden about it. He's I mean, the I would love to secretary. Isn't yes, he? the yeah. culture, culture secretary. I would love to say that I think that they um, understood a little more. I mean, I, I, I have seen a report. Uh, I don't know what's going to be in the report on theatre that's coming out on Monday, but I sincerely hope it doesn't contain some of the things that I've seen in their advice. One of which was a brilliant one for musicals that you're not allowed to sing. So, <laughs> um, I, 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 you know, I, I, one lives in hope, but all one can do is to try and demonstrate and to be positive. I, 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 I've been over 50 years in the theatre. It's my life. It's my blood. It's absolutely awful to see everything that I've loved in my life gone. Uh, and the, and, and the theatres are my way, you know, of, of putting something back into the business that's been so good to me. And I want to prove that they can be open. Lord, Lord Webb, thank you very much for talking to us this morning. 27 minutes past eight and let's hope that theatre can soon go the way of sport.
being back. Yes. Rob Bonnet has more matches to Absolutely. look forward to this Michelle, evening, Rob. Yes, hi Michelle. Two more Premier League matches, in fact, this evening. Norwich against Southampton, followed by Tottenham versus Manchester United, as the season's resumption continues amidst a crushing schedule of 92 games to be played across 40 days. All of them will be broadcast live, with a good proportion free to air. Sky will grant non-paying access to 25 fixtures, and the BBC has four games first time match of the day has had live Premier League football. Well, former Newcastle and England forward Alan Shearer will no doubt be deeply involved, but first his impressions of the impact made by footballers off the pitch, not just by Raheem Sterling and Marcus Rashford, but also elsewhere. Well, there's more than, than, than those guys. I mean, some of the, I mean, footballers often get criticised, um, and sometimes rightly so. But I think we have to look at some of the work that has been done in the last three or four months, whether that is Harry Kane and the sponsorship of, of Orient, Jordan Henderson, and gathering all the captains together to make a huge donation to, to the NHS. Troy Deeney, Raheem Sterling for talking uh, about racism. And, I mean, Marcus Rashford has to have a mention because of what he has done and what he has delivered and getting the government to, to make that U-turn in the way that he, he, he did, delivering food for millions of uh, underprivileged children, the amount of money that uh, that he raised. So there's been a lot of good work that, uh, that some footballers have done and football clubs uh, and the Premier League also in, in the, for the work that they have done in, uh, in their co uh, community. So, yeah, some, some good work being done. Just thinking particularly about Rashford and Sterling, I mean, they're both England internationals, of course. I just wonder whether the culture of self-confidence and self-expression created by Gareth Southgate lies a little behind what they've been doing. Yeah, I think Gareth has a, a great understanding uh, with his players and what some of his players have had to go through. Uh, I think the way Gareth talks, very articulate in a very professional manner, um, without doubt I think his players will look at him, admire him for that and in the way that Raheem has spoken and the way that Marcus Rashford has spoken and delivered those two guys, without doubt they will take uh, inspiration and heart from listening to their, uh, to their manager for in at England. Let's talk a little bit about TV presentations, since that's the only way we're going to be able to follow the rest of the season. Uh, specifically, what did you make of Sky's introduction of low-level crowd noise uh, effects to accompany the action? Do you like it? Um, well, I listened to uh, I listened I had a listen to it, and also obviously without it, um, I, did, I didn't to be honest. No, because it was sort of one constant noise without whenever the ball got mm. near the goal, the excitement, etc. So I I much preferred it without the uh, without the crowd noise on, so I could hear the players shouting and screaming and the coaches and the managers from the uh, from the sidelines trying to get their point across so I, I preferred it without the uh, without the crowd not yes. has, there, has there been a, a conversation in the match of the day office about it you know what they're going to do they're going to give the option on their live game um, I'm bearing in mind it's our first top flight live game uh, in 32 years I think it is, is Rob so there is an option uh, and there is an option there for you if you want the, uh, the crowd noise yes I mean, talking about the atmosphere at the ground, I also thought it was interesting the way in which uh, the Sheffield United players in that first match quickly accepted the ruling about the goal that never was. Uh, we may find that the lack of passion in the stadium transfers itself to the players and we get a, well, I don't know, a more respectful attitude to referees. What do you think? No, I, 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 without a doubt, I totally agree with that. And I'm also bearing in mind that... Um the players have been told and they are aware that um, they're because of no crowd in the the Today programme continues on FM, but now on Radio 4 Longwave, on digital radio and on BBC Sounds, it's time for Yesterday in Parliament with me, Sean Curran. Good morning. Coming up between now and nine, Michael Gove says there's no hard deadline for the trade talks between the UK and the European Union. But it is the case that um, if we haven't secured uh, significant progress uh, by October, then it will be difficult demands for action to tackle health inequalities affecting black and ethnic minority communities. It's not the pandemic that discriminates, it is society. And should the Foreign Office take over another ministry following the announcement of its merger with the Department for International Development? By eventually bringing the Department for International Trade into the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, surely that would make sense now. 
At the start of this week, Boris Johnson and EU leaders agreed that they needed to intensify the negotiations on post-Brexit relations if there was going to be a trade deal by the end of the year. The Prime Minister said he saw no reason why the two sides couldn't do a deal next month. The Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, Michael Gove, appeared in front of the Northern Ireland Committee and told them there was no cut-off date for the talks. We don't have a, a, a date per se penciled in, uh, but it is the case that um, if we haven't secured uh, significant progress uh, by October, then it will be difficult. But again, you know it when you see it. So, so by, by mid-October, business will know whether it's one thing or the other? I would hope that we would have clarity beforehand, but it becomes increasingly difficult if we're not on a trajectory towards an agreement, um, increasingly difficult to ensure that uh, that uh, free trade agreement could be concluded uh, if we haven't uh, secured agreement, as I say, by October. The minister was being questioned there by the Conservative chair of the Northern Ireland Committee, Simon Hall. The government has said that whatever happens in the trade talks, the UK won't extend the Brexit transition period, which ends in December. Mr Gove was asked what changes businesses in Northern Ireland would see when they tried to send goods to the rest of the UK after the 1st of January. There should be no requirement for any type of check um, or any uh, 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 interruption in the free flow of that good into the UK.